Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. On today's show, we take a look at the Asian American community and newsmakers in politics and tension between the United States and North Korea. Plus, we'll have the latest reports on health and wellness to help improve our lives. Now, here's a look at what's ahead. A fresh face in politics meet Assemblymember Yulin Nu. Escalating war of words, Kyung Yoon reports on U.S.-North Korea relations. Lighting up, Mike Gilliam explains why smoking is on the rise in Asian American communities. And how healthy are your bones? Minnie Rowe shares tips on how to prevent osteoporosis. This and more on Asian American Life. We start our show with Assembly Member Yu Lin Nu. She became the first Asian American to represent Manhattan and Chinatown. I sat down with her recently to talk about her freshman year in office and her plans for the future. When you walk into Yulin News downtown Manhattan office, you might think you walked into a cool tech startup. Okay, well, we chose, right? There was yep. like one with Scott at Pride. But her staff, mostly young and yes, hip, are actually all about public service. And their boss has been quite busy since taking public office in January. What's your favorite part about being in public office? I think um, it's actually the constituent services still to this day. I love to be able to see that we can provide access to government. On November 16, New made history. She became the first Asian American assembly member to represent District 65, which includes the financial district, South Street Streetport, Battery Park City, and Chinatown, where 40% of the population is Asian. She's also the first APA to represent Manhattan in the assembly. But elected office wasn't always the goal. We met New two years ago when she served as chief of staff for assembly member Ron Kim, the first Korean American in the state legislature, and at the time, the only Asian serving in the assembly. With Ron being the only Asian American elected on the entire state level, I felt like we really needed to have much more representation and it was a big driver for me to really think about how little voice um, our Asian American communities have in government. And there just happened to be a seat open in the district where she lived. Longtime assembly member and Speaker of the House Sheldon Silver was forced to step down when he was arrested and later convicted on federal corruption charges. An appeals court recently overturned that conviction. New was encouraged to run by her mentors, but she lost the special election. Instead of throwing in the towel, she ran in the Democratic primary and won, beating out four candidates. She later won the general election in November with 76% of the vote. She found herself in the spotlight, even featured in Vogue magazine. But behind the scenes, she said the campaign was tough and an eye-opener for her. She found her gender was a topic of many conversations with voters and in political circles. We get a lot of the, uh, you're to this, you're to that. You know, that's something that's very, very prevalent in having a woman of color running for office. You see people saying, you know, oh, your hair's too long, your hair's too short, your skirt's too long, your skirt's too short, your heels are too high, you're not wearing heels enough, you're not smiling enough, you smile too much. You know, it just, you're either to this or to that. And I think that um, that's one of the challenges of running as a woman and as a woman of color especially. She points out that she has 16 years experience in state politics. New was also surprised with some of the racism she encountered. My mom and my dad, like they came to help me with the campaign and um, there were people who like shouted at them and said, you know, go back where you came from, this is not your country and things like that. And I was just kind of startled, like we're living in a democratic district in, in New York City, you know, and, and these were still things that people were saying. New was born in Taiwan and immigrated to the U.S. when her father received a scholarship to attend the University of Idaho. They later moved to Texas, Oregon, then Washington State, where New attended college. Moving from town to town, they were usually one of the few Asian faces, and her family faced isolation and discrimination. I knew that I was angry at a lot of things. <laughs> I knew that I wanted to advocate on behalf of the community in some way. And I felt like if I knew how government worked, then I could go and wreak havoc and change it somehow. 
After college, she moved to New York to get her master's at Baruch. Then she settled into life in public service and thought she'd stay behind the scenes. I think that so often women, and especially women of color, self-select out. Uh, we often think that, you know, somebody else will do you know, better. According to the Center for American Women and Politics, in 2017, 6% of the more than 7,000 state legislatures in the country were women of color. And these new legislatures are bringing a new voice to government. News, an outspoken champion of immigrants, including protecting dreamers, the undocumented children of immigrants. And she sponsored a bill to disaggregate AAPI data. Asian Americans are the fastest growing minority group in our state. We also have more Asian Americans living in poverty in New York City than any other minority group. Asian Americans make up almost 10% of the state's population, 14% in New York City, but the community receives less than 1% of city services. Um, this is something that will make it so that we know which languages that the agency should be using when servicing our Asian American populations. We are not one monolithic group. And she's also become an inspiration to young people who now see a reflection of themselves in government. In the last uh, year, we've had over 80 uh, young people volunteer in our office. So, you know, I think that just having a little bit of a perspective on how government works, I think that every single person who comes out of our program also can feel like they impacted government. And I'm proud to say that so many of them decided to go into public service after their experience here. For Asian American Life, I'm Ernabel DeMillo. Kyung Yoon, the escalating war of words between the leaders of the United States and North Korea has many Americans on edge. But for the approximately 1.7 million people of Korean descent living in America, the tensions hit close to home. So peace is the only solution. For Pastor Chung Ho James Kim, the idea of another catastrophic war on the Korean Peninsula is impossible to fathom. Not only that there are 20 million North Koreans and 50 million South Koreans, about 40 million. And it's a small nation. It's like a flushing New York to, to Fort Lee, New Jersey, Hudson River in between. If the war breaks out, it's, it's a disaster uh, that you, you cannot imagine. Pastor Kim grew up seeing firsthand the pain and suffering of separation after the war. His father escaped North Korea when he was 16 and never saw his family again. My father passed away when he was 47. And uh, I remember my mother drawing two bags of something and, and she told me, you take care of it since you're first born. It was my father's diary. He wrote a diary uh, from 16 years old till his death. And from that diary, I found out every day he was longing for family in North Korea. More than 100,000 Korean Americans are estimated to be members of a divided family who still have relatives living in North Korea. For them, the missile tests and the rising tensions between the United States and North Korea are especially troubling. Although you hate North Korean government, if you're from North, they always talk with a cry, with the tears in their hearts, because their family is there. For people who escape North Korea, have a different uh, place for them. The Korean War began on June 25, 1950, and technically never ended. A ceasefire in July 1953 stopped the fighting on the peninsula, but North and South Korea have remained in an armed standoff, divided by a demilitarized zone crossing the 38th parallel. Since July this year, North Korea has launched a series of powerful missiles and conducted nuclear tests, prompting threats from the U.S. president like this one at the United Nations National Assembly in September. The United States has great strength and patience, but if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice 
but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. Trump uh, is uh, our new president, uh, escalate attention. It's really fearful because uh, uh, when, when, when he talks about North Korea, he talks as if uh, you demonize people. When you demonize people, you justify eliminating them. But for a person like me, they are beautiful people just like anybody else in the United States or South Korea. And Korean Americans um, should be able to speak from the perspective of their own experience and tell uh, the American public that, um, and educate them about who we are, our unique history. Sam Yoon is the executive director of the Council of Korean Americans, a nonprofit organization working to raise the voice, visibility, and influence of Korean Americans. He says when it comes to the topic of North Korea, Korean Americans are largely absent in the media, except perhaps as commentators. It's, it's different to speak as an expert who knows a lot about a Korea uh, uh, than it is to be a Korean American citizen who votes and who says, I am being impacted um, by um, the failure of our government to engage um, North Korea in a productive way. I feel threatened. My family in Korea uh, feels threatened uh, by what's happening. And, um, and my voice matters. We're not getting that out into the media. Pastor Kim has worked for decades with the church movement to engage in humanitarian missions to North Korea and to promote peaceful reunification. Whenever we talk about North Korea, even the intellectual people have this uh, assumption that the North Koreans are not people, and North Korean leaders are not, not real people, but they are. They have names and they have faces, they have mothers and fathers. So when, when I visit North Korea, those are the things I, I bring back and help the church people to see them as people. Korean Americans are organizing through their churches, community, and advocacy groups to raise their voices and call for toning down the rhetoric and exploring a peaceful resolution on the Korean Peninsula. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. I'm Mike Gilliam for Asian American Life. Over the last decade, there's been a dramatic decline in the number of people smoking, but that has not been the case in the Asian American community. Here, people continue to light up. The smoking rate uh, among Asian American men in New York City today is about 25%. That's one in four Asian men smoke. Asian American men have the highest rate of smoking in New York City, and unfortunately, the trend is going up. Regina Lee is Vice President of Public Affairs at the Charles B. Wang Community Health Center. She says you see the growing problem on the streets of Chinatown. The reason smoking rates are going up in the Asian American community are very complex. One is that the community is predominantly an immigrant community. So many men in this community are foreign born uh, in Asia, in China. Unfortunately, smoking rates in China are extremely high. One out of three cigarettes smoked in the world is smoked in China. Yu Wang smoked for 25 years, picking up the habit in China when he was just 15. Now he's 40. When I was a kid, uh, I saw many adults smoke. So I think that's a very cool thing. Yu says he smoked because he thought it helped him to think clearly and concentrate at work. But eventually, he noticed it was taking a toll on his respiratory system. I found my, my body become weak, and especially when I do some heavy exercise, just like uh, running, uh, climbing. Two years ago, Wu Wang came across the Charles B. Wang Community Health Center and their smoking cessation program. He quit and hasn't had a cigarette in almost two years. Yu says he also used stop smoking products, including nicotine replacement gum. Helping me a little bit, 
uh, the more detail they describe and the more fear I feel. <laughs> New York City has been at the forefront of using that fear in the effort to eliminate smoking. Every time you smoke, cigarettes are eating you alive. In addition to powerful public service announcement, the city limits where cigarettes can be purchased. They've also hiked taxes so that a pack now costs more in New York than anywhere in the country, a minimum of about $13 a pack or more. Who wants to pay $14 for a pack of cigarettes? I mean, that's crazy. Okay, have a seat up here. So, how have you been? Good. Any trouble breathing? No. Okay. Coughing? No. Wheezing? No. Short of breath? Dr. Perry Pong treats smokers at the Wang Community Health Center. He says New York City has really done a good job of deterring smoking, especially among young people, by doing things like not allowing smoking inside restaurants and bars, workplaces, and even outside in public spaces. Still, people smoke. Deep down they know it's bad for you, but it's like, it's the media versus the long term. The experts say they keep puffing away because the city's efforts are not reaching the Asian community. And the television ads are in English and Spanish. Now discussions are underway with the city to launch ads in Chinese. Since the city's initiatives are not having the intended effect in the Asian community, the people at the Wang Center are using a multi-pronged approach to take on the smoking problem. Every person who comes to the clinic is assessed for smoking. We offer um, counseling by a health coach. The counseling is bilingual in, in uh, English, um, Cantonese, and uh, Mandarin. Accessibility is also important. We can offer counseling either by phone or in person. They don't have to come into the health center for a visit. Nicotine replacement patches and gum can cost $90 every two weeks, but the center provides them for free to patients without health insurance. So we try to reduce the, the cost as much as possible, and we try to reduce the barriers as much as possible. They also enlist doctors in the community to deliver the stark facts to smokers. Smokers live an average nine, 10 years less. What they don't realize is that smoking is not that kind of death. Smoking can cause head and neck cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer, stomach cancer, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, Often in the Asian community, it's not just like I go to the hospital if I'm the father or the grandfather. No, I'm dragging along mother, grandmother, kids, someone like is expected to stay with me overnight. So Dr. Pong says there are some points children can make to their elders who smoke. You want to see me have a family. You want to see your grandchildren. Don't cut yourself short. Fixing the smoking problem in the Asian American community will take a global approach. So unless China takes action to do a better job in reducing smoking, um, it's gonna impact the rest of the world. China has 320 million smokers, more than the entire U.S. population. Every day, they reportedly manufacture six billion cigarettes. In the meantime, the people at the Wang Center say they will continue to do their part. We have to do much broader work with our partners, with our colleagues, with community physicians to begin to change the cultural norm in the community. We must help our men quit smoking because the future for us, the future really is a smoke-free community. Now, if you want to quit smoking, there are lots of resources available through the city of New York. Or you can reach out to the Charles B. Wang Community Center and they'll offer help and support. I'm Mike Gilliam for Asian American Life. I'm Minnie Rowe. As we age, cancer, heart disease, and stroke are the leading ailments that we try to prevent. But there is another disease that you wouldn't necessarily know you had until it was too late. Osteoporosis may seem minor compared to the other diseases, but its outcome can be just as deadly, leading some doctors to call this the silent killer. We're learning about the stretching. At 65 years old, Meng Xinchu found out that she had osteopenia, the precursor to osteoporosis, following a DEXA or bone density scan as part of her routine annual checkup. Now I am 75 years old. Uh, maybe two, three years old, but I can feel, feel the, uh, uh, I'm now old now. 
Cho is especially careful about keeping osteoporosis at bay because of her family history. Her mother broke her hip as a result of osteoporosis after slipping on a patch of black ice. She just wasn't the same after she fell. She wasn't quite as mobile. Her walk or her gait wasn't quite as steady. Daughter Rosa Cho, who is also a physician in New York City, is well aware of the risk of osteoporosis, especially for Asian Americans, because of body frame, diet, and lifestyle. Being an Asian woman predisposes her to having osteopenia or um, lower density bone mass, so I really wasn't surprised. She talks to her mother every day, making sure her diet is rich in calcium and protein, and that she exercises by walking, doing weight-bearing resistance training, yoga, or line dancing at her local community senior center. I like the line dance. It's a, we listen to music and the, move the body. Yeah, it's a lot of people. Typically, osteoporosis is associated with the elderly, but in reality, once a woman hits menopause and is no longer producing estrogen, bone density takes a big dive. Men are not exempt either. It just occurs later in life. Studies show that one in two women and up to one in four men over the age of 50 will break a bone due to osteoporosis. But unlike other diseases where there are warning signs, Osteoporosis is symptom and pain-free until you break a bone. On a given day, a person wouldn't necessarily know they have osteoporosis. Dr. Jonas Leibowitz is an endocrinologist in Westchester County, New York. He says while the disease itself is not a fatal one, if you fall and break a hip, it could have devastating consequences. We often cite a statistic that if a person fractures a hip uh, based on an osteoporosis-related uh, fracture, that usually one in four of those patients are not alive one year later. According to the National Osteoporosis Foundation, based in Washington, D.C., the disease is responsible for 2 million broken bones and 19 billion in related costs every year. By 2025, the number is predicted to rise to 3 million fractures and $25.3 billion in costs annually. Well, like most of our diseases, probably prevention is, is your best bet. So active in sports, outside sun exposure, good intake of nutrients, and keep them healthy. I think you start by building a good bone density. If you get your bone density to a higher peak level, then you're starting at a higher point when the bone density eventually be begins to decline. Eating foods rich in calcium found in dairy products, certain fish and produce like broccoli, collard greens, soybeans, Getting plenty of vitamin D through sunlight and supplements is important to overall bone health. Doctors say a person hits their peak bone density at age 30 and holds it for the next 20 years. Doctors recommend a DEXA scan to check the bones after menopause for women, after age 70 for men. This would be an example of a cross-section of bone that has osteoporosis. And as you can see, the areas of bone fibers have larger areas of porous areas between them. Those porous areas rec represent osteoporosis. This would be a normal bone where you can see there are more areas of thickened bone and less areas of porous or porosity. A bone that is more porous is much more likely to fracture. Check your FRAC score, a risk assessment test that looks at everything from where you live, family history, to lifestyle choices such as smoking and drinking, and then calculate your risk of breaking a major bone over the next 10 years. The osteoporosis is a disease that's underdiagnosed and unfortunately undertreated even when it is diagnosed. Any fracture that shouldn't occur should be a signal to be, for treatment. And this is one instance where being thinner is not better. The heavier you are, the stronger your bones because they work harder to carry you around. Of course, the flip side of that is a greater risk of other diseases, such as diabetes, high cholesterol, and blood pressure. Asian Americans tend to be thinner and smaller in frame, therefore are at an increased risk for osteoporosis. And while Asians consume calcium-rich foods such as soy, vegetables, and fish, adopting an American diet cuts out this crucial element in their diet. Adding on to that, many are lactose intolerant and are unable to get their calcium through dairy products. All right. One, 
Keep your wrist straight. Okay. Bend at the elbows. Oh. Rosa also takes measures to ensure that there are no fall hazards in her parents' home and educates them about fall prevention. We have a three level house, so at all the time my husband said, you went go down, you hold the rail. Thanks to her daughter's diligence, active lifestyle, as well as a good diet, Cho has been able to maintain her bone density levels. As long as she takes care not to fall and break a bone, Rosa and her mom can look forward to many more years of activity together. One more. You can do it. One more, one more, one more, one more, one more. Okay. One more. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. Good job. Okay, mom. Give me five. Ten. Ten. <laughs> That's our show for now. For more information, be sure to follow us on Facebook at Asian American Life. Thanks for watching. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We'll see you next time.